if everyone would like to introduce themselves, that'd be a really nice way to start. So I'm going to pass over to you, Louise. Hey, um, I'm Louise. I'm one of the support team for OFN. Um, probably a lot of you had contact with me. Uh, actually, I think I've only contacted Rachel. Um, but anyway, um, I do support. So if you email support, then you probably get me or Kobe or Joe. So that's me. Uh, maybe we could kind of pass it around and, and um, Rachel, if you'd like to introduce yourself in your hub, that would be amazing. Hi there, um, Rachel Gambro. I'm based up in Aberdeen. Um, we started our food hub, the Deeside Food Hub, last October and we ran what we called a, a trial for a couple of months and it was very successful and we were ready to get going again. But unfortunately that's on hold temporarily because of our, our host site um, is, a, is a school with vulnerable children. So um, we're, we're taking time out to learn a lot from OFN and uh, tune into your webinars. <laughs> but we'll, we'll shortly be back online. Awesome, thanks Rachel. And would anyone else like to introduce themselves? There's no pressure if, if you prefer to just be a silent observer, but maybe Kay, you'd like to introduce yourself and, and what hub you're from? I've just realised I've logged on on Kay's um, thing and I'm not Kay. <laughs> so I feel like I've just had a moment of, I'm not Kay Johnson, I'm definitely not <laughs> Kay Johnson, but I work with Kay Johnson and I've, I've been using her link as well. So there you go. Who are you? <laughs> We have a mystery, a, my a mystery woman. I know. Well, I'm another Rachel, so I, I was getting really confused. Um, but yes, I work with the uh, with the larder in Preston. Um, so we are looking at setting up a whole kind of got part way through it anyway. Um, I just need to do a little bit more work on actually what we're going to have, what we're going to be selling in that hub and that. Um, so yeah, nice to be here. Want to learn lots, and I'm not Kay Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Would um, anyone else who's joined us today like to introduce themselves and the hub they're from? And again, no pressure if you want to be a silent observer. That's totally fine with you. And um, so if you do want to introduce yourself, just unmute and say hello. That would be amazing. Um, hi, my name is Kaya. Um, kids broke my camera completely. Um, and um, I run a. I'm one of the persons that's run um, Neighborhood in Pitlochry, an online platform. Um, I'm, I'm also one of the directors at a local zero waste store. Awesome, nice to meet you, Kaja. Thanks for coming. Beautiful town, Pitlochry. I do agree. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Francesca. My camera is also not working. I'm actually using my mum's laptop and uh, yeah, it's a bit vintage, I think. So um, I'm also based up in, in Aberdeenshire. Um, I, I work at a local organic food place called Lembas, which Rachel will probably know about. So, um, but I do more of the packing and the growing, um, but I also volunteer at a community food larder in another place called Stonehaven and I feel like I've got knowledge about the growing side but I'm lacking knowledge in obviously the kind of the background and the money side and the accountability and, and this kind of things and for me further down the line as I progress it's it's obviously something I want to know more about so um, yeah thank you for putting today on. Did you awesome. say then Buzz? Lembas, yeah, they've like been. Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, like the, yeah, the elf inbred. Um, but yeah, they they're an organic wholesaler and producer, and have, have been doing stuff in Aberdeenshire, I think, since the late eighties. Um, so, yeah, they've obviously, but they they do, you know, they they run the business, and I'm employed by them. And I just, for me, I want to learn more about if I was to run my own business, how to do the. The business side of it basically. <laughs> Brilliant, well you're definitely at the right session for that so thanks so much for coming Francesca and um, Kate or Sophie would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, again no 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 pressure, not we'll, we'll get started. Hi hi I'm um, sorry same 
a camera problem, but um, my name is Sophia um, and I'm just starting um, my PhD at the RAU. So it's, I'm uh, joining this from a different perspective, really, because my focus is on SMEs and their um, role within developing a circular economy. So it's yeah, a completely different perspective, but I was really interested to join. So I hope you don't mind me sort of piggybacking onto this a little bit. Welcome. Not at all. Well, welcome to, to the space. Sounds like an interesting um, and complex PhD. So, <laughs> thank you. Hello, um, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm from Ashford uh, Kent Food Hubs, and I'm actually here at my pack day. Hello, my camera. I don't know how to use Zoom. Um, so um, I, I didn't realise that I didn't have my camera on. Um, so yeah, I'm just actually at my pack day. So um, I may like disappear at some points, but um, I struggle to find the time to jump onto these conversations. And obviously they're all about amazing topics that I want to be involved with and learn more about. Um, so yeah, here I am for however long I can be. Hey, thanks for coming, Kate. And we're going to record, we, we're recording this session now actually. So um, I'll share it in the event page in the Facebook group um, after we're done. So that's where you can find it. Um, hopefully in the next couple of days, it depends on how good my, I'm in rural France at the moment, my internet's not so great. So as soon as I can <laughs> upload it, I will. Um, cool. So I think that's everyone. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is a session around accounting and profitability. And I'm going to hand over to Oliver, who's um, prepared a, a session on bookkeeping for us and has a, a lot to share. And then at the end, after Oliver's finished, we'll have time for a Q&A. So passing over to you, Oliver. And thanks. Thanks so much for, for, yeah, for what you brought to the session. Lovely to be here with you guys. Um, so my amazing slides are really, really basic. Um, just some bullet points. And uh, no one likes death by PowerPoint nowadays. So I'm not going to inflict it on you. Um, so it, it's really difficult to, to know what, what information is going to be useful to whom. Uh, you guys are most likely in completely um, different places from one enterprise to the next. Um, so it's really superficial. And then just you know ask questions later uh, if, you know, if you've got anything which is particular to your circumstances. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd go through um, why to do bookkeeping at all and um, different options of how you can go about it, um, what it can do for you and how you can make life a bit easier. Um, partly it's just a legal requirement um, and HMRC will ask you to um, you know, hold certain records and it's it's certainly necessary to some extent for that. Uh, but also you'll want to know if you're making money, you want to base your business decisions on something concrete and not just not just gut feel. Although I must say some people do extremely well just on gut feel. Um, but uh, it helps to have some data underpinning your decisions, whether you want to expand or move to a different site or whatever it may be. Um, at least that's just some examples, but you know, how, how do you know otherwise whom you owe money and, and, and who owes you money? Um, and, and credit control is usually the phrase used for who owes you and how much and since when and that sort of thing and chasing it up. And you can make your life a lot easier if you're on top of that. So the absolute minimum that you'll want to do if you have any sort of company enterprise, social enterprise, or you're just self-employed, is you want to know what's coming in and what's going out and keep your receipts. And that should keep the tax man at the very least happy. Although that is the absolute minimum um, they list on their website. All sorts of things about what other companies you owe share, own shares in, for example, um, which I, uh, I reckon is probably not applicable to most of you. Um, but obviously it's all there online. So how complex and how simple can you make it? Can you just run it off a spreadsheet? Yeah, absolutely. Depends on your circumstances. Uh, or otherwise you may want to use software. Um, if you're VAT registered and, and you, you file VAT, 
Um, certainly, if it's under the making tax digital scheme, then you, you'll need software. And I um, don't want to assume that everyone knows what I'm talking about. So um, uh, for a couple of years now, if you turned over more than 85,000, you had to submit VAT in a particular way via software and not just by logging into your HMRC account. Um, that apart, it's mainly up to your circumstances. You can do an awful lot with Google Sheets nowadays. Um, and and if, you, if you enjoy that sort of thing and you know complex formulas that end in five, five closing brackets at the end or something, then uh, you know, who knows what can be done. Um, you may have an accountant who does payroll for you if you employ anyone. Um, so that's not necessarily a reason to go to software. Um, I'd say use software if you know if you can possibly afford it and get your head around it. It can make your life a lot easier. Uh, I've listed some examples there on the right why it might be a good idea. Um, you would be surprised at the number of people I work with who never reconcile accounts. Um, essentially, it means to match your records, be that your spreadsheet or your, your bookkeeping in the software uh, against what's actually on your account, uh, on your online banking or your PayPal or whatever, and make sure that it, there's no mistakes. And there's always mistakes. Um, and, and you can't rely on anything unless you check and make sure you've not made any mistakes. So, um, a lot of it um, depends on how analytically you want to go about it. If you're really small, then you just know what's going on. Let's be honest about it. Um, but the bigger you get and the more complex, the more you may want advanced features. Let's put it that way. Um, I've also found it depends on who are your, uh, you know, your sort of core team, your directors, if you have any, um, those that might show any interest in financial oversight. If no one ever is ever interested, then you know, then you might not want to run the most complex of reports. Um, but that's exactly what I'm going to show you now by switching screens to um, bookkeeping software and, and show you the sort of things it can do if if you're that way inclined. Um, it's QuickBooks. Uh, that doesn't mean it couldn't be Zero or Sage. Um, it's just the one I use and the one I'm familiar with. Let's switch over. And we are here. Um, must that come up for you? Yep, good. Um, good. Great. Uh, so, what I want to show you is the sort of things it can do for you, so you, you can sort of think about whether, um, whether it could be useful for you and, and how complex you want to make things. Uh, before I look at reports, just as an example, um, and so th this is, a, by the way, an example company, so I'm not showing anyone's real data. Uh, QuickBooks made all this stuff up. Um, but just to, to give you an example, so um, not just QuickBooks, the others do it as well. They, they have bank feeds, they link into your online banking, they download transactions, and they try to match what's going on there to what you've already told it. Um, so for example, here it's suggesting it's recognized a certain expense. Um, and then you can set up all sorts of rules to automate things a bit. Um, and it's just come a very long way from just a few years ago uh, when none of that was possible. Nowadays, everything talks to other apps. Um, now, one thing which has changed during my time at the Food Hub at Stroud Co. is the sort of just by, by staff changes, I suppose, the sort of interest in, in looking at, at financial reports and analyzing what's going on and so on. Um, and so 
if either you or someone you work with is really into these sort of things, then uh, what period is this showing? Let me go back to um, bring up a longer period. And I want to see what you make the money on and what you spend it on and how you do what, what your bottom line is, etc. Then, you know, this, this brings up a very um, quick and easy profit and loss report. You always have income at the top, expenses in the middle and your profit at the bottom. Um, fairly straightforward, at least, at least in simple terms. Um, very easy to also get get figures up by month. So you can see there's a bit of a, a gap in the fake data they've inputted here, the sample data. But but essentially, you know, how, how did you do month on month? How did I do last month compared to month before? And that sort of thing. Um, and this can be very useful, uh, especially if you know, especially if you're working in certain cycles, like, like we often do with OFN, with weekly cycles and that sort of thing. You could drill this down into smaller periods. You could look at it quarterly, whatever suits you. Um, one thing which is quite sort of getting quite involved in bookkeeping terms, but which is worth considering for the sort of enterprises we run, is um, what I do nowadays is when, when income comes in, when people order, um, that's just recorded as, as you would expect. But then I sort of artificially put in a cost of sales, which marks for that particular month, how much our purchase cost was for the, all that food stuff. Um, and I don't wait for the invoices to arrive. Uh, so that's handled separately. And, you know, if, if you are into bookkeeping or you, you employ a bookkeeper or whatever, you know, I'd be more than happy to, to explain in more detail what I mean by that. But it's extremely difficult to see how you're doing month on month if you're waiting for the invoice, which a supplier may send every week, or he may only send it every quarter, or he may forget until you chase them for it. Um, and only then you enter your your costs basically. And that just makes no sense in terms of reporting. And you have huge costs in one month and huge profits in another and nothing matches up. Right. Um, I'll leave that for now and switch back to the slides, I think at this point. Um, and we might come back to QuickBooks if required later. There we go. Um, a few don'ts, and I'm really sorry if they are completely obvious to you. It's just, just really difficult to sort of judge where people are at. But um, so, I mean, that first point, don't just look at the bank balance. I've seen it done. Um, and, you know, you, you think you're doing well, but there are stats that haven't been picked up. There is income you shouldn't have had, and it's just not a good idea. Um, so uninvoiced supplies, that links in a bit to what I just said. Uh, just because someone hasn't invoiced you doesn't mean you don't owe the money to keep that in mind. Um, I think the third point speaks for itself. Um, don't assume other people are more competent than you. Just because they feel more confident doesn't mean they're more competent. Um, you know, again, I've seen it all. Um, uh, if you take money at the point of sale, like via Stripe, then it doesn't affect you. But if you, you know, if you allow people to buy and pay later, I've seen it so often that someone insists they have paid and they swear blind and almost accuse you. Uh, 
and you know and stuff of course you don't of course you don't say you don't believe them right so um really sorry can't find your payment can you help me out um give me you know give me the date you paid and, and how you paid so that i can find it i'd be really grateful and of course they come back and say ah oops i didn't pay after all um and, and the same for, for supplier bills you know don't don't assume that they've built you the right thing make sure you've got some some sort of way of checking they're not necessarily doing anything with evil intent just just we you know trust no one just because we're all fallible um, and we make mistakes um so now that i like integrations it depends on which way you're inclined, what, what your circumstances are, what software you use. Um, OFN can talk to your bookkeeping software. I'm not entirely sure what sort of level of subscription you need for that and so on. So um, I, I'd leave that to someone else to, to answer for you. Um, but it, it's certainly something I do uh, for Stroud Co. And failing that, Stripe can talk to us bookkeeping software um, and other platforms like Go Cordless. Uh, you don't have to ma enter anything manually nowadays, really. Uh, apart from, of course, that most of us like to bank with ethical banks and they are a nightmare. And I, you know, I'm completely on board with ethical banking. I, I you know, get the ethical consumer magazine and everything, and um, but co-op and triodos and and uh, what's the other one? Unity Trust, uh, just, just the, the only ones that don't, uh, and it can be a bit frustrating when you try to do the right thing. <laughs> it doesn't make your life any easier. Anyway, so that's, that's something I personally like. I like when software speaks to each other and uh, I don't have to do it. Uh, just though I mentioned that uh, go cordless, not because it's that amazing, it completely depends on your circumstances. Um, but we actually, you may recognize it because preferably we take your user fees um, via direct debit and that, that's go cordless, which we use for that. But it can be useful if you, if you allow your, uh, customers in you know, a sort of a membership sort of setup to to hold credit, um, so you hold credit for them, hold their money for them, and they sort of use it up bit by bit, um, and so the direct debit can just take any sort of varying amount if they got ten pounds credit and they've ordered forty pounds, it'll take the difference, and uh, just all that does it all for you in the software and you don't really have to touch it. You just send the invoice and, uh, and it does the rest for you. Um, I suspect most of us use Stripe and just take the full amount at the time of ordering, um, but just in case. Uh, and that's all the slides I've got for you. I deliberately didn't want to bore you for too long. Um, and just also in case none of this is actually relevant to you, <laughs> because as I say, it's really difficult to, to judge. Um, and so I think uh, at this point, I'll stop the screen share and, um, you know, ask questions. Uh, I will try and answer things now, most likely. I might have to, uh, you know, go away and find things out for you, but that's not a problem either. Um, over to to you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Oliver. That was so helpful. And I can see already that we've got our first question. Um, at Kate, I just saw you raise your hand. Um, do you want me to unmute you? Or are you able to? Oh, yeah, there we go. Hi Oliver, sorry I, I got in a bit late so I may have uh, missed you talking about something. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, I'm the chair of Slow Food in Birmingham and we have been running a hub. We moved over to OFN um, a few months ago and um, prior to that the hub 
software that we were using, they actually did all of the accounting and things and just paid us a commission. Um, and what we have now been talking about is whether or not, because we're getting in everybody's payments before it goes out to the producers, if that pushes us up into a category where we have to register as a business, do you know what the thresholds are in for things like that? Yeah, uh, just let me shut my door. My uh, family has just come home. Um, so what sort of entity are you? Are you a company or? No, we're a, um, an unincorporated club. Okay. Um, no, then actually, I must admit, no, I don't. Um, I work on the assumption that any sort of food business um, has to sort of report in some way, um, but I know that you can get away with a lot under the radar if you're not incorporated or not um, you know, just, just some, some community group. Yeah. Um, but none of my clients are, and it's maybe not surprising uh, because you probably wouldn't want to pay me if you're in that sort of category. Okay, I'll um, do some research elsewhere. Um, okay, I would, I've just done some, a little bit of reading about that recently online. Um, there's a lot of advice on the government website if you go on there. And I think if you're, if you, what you probably are classified at the moment as a sole trader, and um, you'd have to declare any profits in your tax return. And obviously if you're reinvesting, but I think it's probably wise if you really read the government website, because um, yeah, that's what I'd say. And it is quite clear there what levels to, 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 to uh, do things in. in it is, it is um, different to uh, though, sorry to interrupt. Um, sole, sole trader is usually someone who's registered self-employed. Uh, and then it's you as an individual and your income is taxed and it doesn't matter if that's from self-employment or from employment, it all gets put together into one big calculation. Um, you may know that you're nodding, um, but uh, an, an incorporated sort of community club sort of setup is different. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I can't say much about it, unfortunately. That's okay. I'll um I'll keep searching. Thanks, Kate, for your question. And um, does anyone else have any any questions? Oliver, I, I have a question, please. Um, so many of our producers um that I'm paying um monthly, um half of them don't even create an invoice. Um, about a quarter of them create an invoice, but provide it two or three months later. And a quarter of them provide it sort of quite timely. But I didn't want to leave all our debts outstanding. So probably very poor practice, but I, I went on, the, on my calculations as to how much I was owing them. Um, and and made the payment before receiving invoices. Apart from that being okay, not not good practice. Is that a, a solution, or should I be pushing them to be providing an invoice, or or what? It's a good solution in practical terms, in, in terms of just wanting to get the job done and you know being pragmatic. Um, if you ask HMRC, they might they might think otherwise. Um, again, I'm not hugely familiar with it, but there are so-called self-invoicing arrangements, and they'll have conditions under which you is to essentially invoice yourself um, on the supplier's behalf. Um, but I can't see anyone get excited about it as long as you can, you know, in the end of the day, if you're ever asked, prove that those were legitimate expenses, um, either by an invoice that came in later or your purchase order emails. 
or you no, know, any, any such like. Uh, I, I'm with you really on on trying to be pragmatic about these things, and I can remember well, you know, what, what, what the suppliers are like, and maybe especially for those for whom the supply they give to you is just so negligible in comparison to the larger business that they just never bother until maybe half a year down the line. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I see no problem with it. I think it's a good, a good solution. Okay. And um, I've got one other question. Um, you mentioned QuickBooks and then obviously Zero and, and others. Mm -hmm. Have you said that you you were showing us QuickBooks because that was your um, your your preference. But how do they compare? Is there do they have all the same functionality, and it's just whichever one you you migrate to, or or is there much of a difference? Mm. <clears throat> it's quite hard to choose unless you try them both out. Um, there are some differences. My experience with zero goes back a few years and wasn't very long. Um, I tried it in what, in my case, on that occasion, what I um, what what I didn't like was that in, in those days I did a lot of credit notes, and I wanted them allocated automatically. Um, just against the customer's balance without me having to say it was against this invoice or that invoice. Um, and that may have changed in the year since. Uh, it may not matter to you. Uh, it's just little, really little things like that. Uh, in the big picture, they are all very similar. And, um, and the main functionality is the, the profit and loss and the balance sheet. Uh, is but there anything the, else that, that you can pull out of it apart from cutting those in different ways? The, the, those are the most important reports, I suppose. You know. um, but uh, I, I you know, assuming again, that we're not talking about VAT at the moment. Not at the moment. Um, you know, just the, the way you can um, have all the data flow together um, in sometimes almost automated ways uh you know uh, can automatically look at stripe it can look at um at your bank etc um and you know if you do invoice people it sort of sends it for you you don't have to attach an invoice to an email um so there's no, there's a lot of stuff it can do for you other than financial reporting and of course the reports rely on you having done that in the first place and having done it diligently um, does that give you an idea yeah okay so when it when it comes to the right moment because at the moment I'm handling it just on the spreadsheet and thinking that I can I can do that for now but I if things go as well as I'm hoping that they will do over the next 12 months that there will be a point that it will be um, madness to continue with the spreadsheet. So I was just wanting to prepare to, to know which one I want to go for. To um, maybe get some help initially, um, just because it's uh, some, some things look obvious. And um, I mean, the bank feeds in, in particular, I found people find very confusing because they, well, it is confusing. Um, there's a difference in the bank feed between what is in your bookkeeping and what it's only showing from your bank and that's not at all obvious and so on so you know if you can get someone to hold your hand for the first four weeks or so and just to, to make sure you're, you're starting off right that would, uh, would be a good idea okay thank you. But they are of course designed for people like like us here to to do things ourselves they're not uh not, not meant for for accountants necessarily so is it necessary to have an accountant if you are cooperated just to do a final check of the accounts once they've been created no so you can you can do your own tax return you just have to feel comfortable just, yeah. and confident to do so yeah. okay perfect all right thank you Pleasure. thanks rachel um does anyone else have any questions 
Uh, just hi, Oliver. I've got a question about QuickBooks, <clears throat> which I've just started using about a month ago. Um, and you, uh, I, I, pres I think QuickBooks is you're able to integrate with the OFN software, but I don't really know what what that means and what advantages that will give to me. So I don't know if you could just explain the, the value of of the integration. Yeah. Um... So um, what I do with um, Stroud Co Food Hub is I make it send the sales receipt into the into QuickBooks every time someone orders. Um, so your 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 income your your sales are already there. Um, and uh, I mean that depends on how involved you get with it, but. Um, for me, the important bit is that it shows the right customer and the, the total they've spent. I don't make it break down you know, exactly what they have bought. I can go back to OFN for that. Um, and then essentially at the end of the month or whatever period you do stuff, all your, your reconciliations and things, um, all the income's already there. And there's no need to put that in manually or to upload a spreadsheet or anything like that. Okay, so that it'll show what income I'll be. Yeah, so it's so yeah, so it's it's income in advance of yeah, actually getting the money from Stripe as well. That's true. Yes, it, it is. Yeah. So in in QuickBooks, you'd have sales receipts, and they deposit into a Stripe account that you've set up in your bookkeeping, um, and then you'll tell your bank feed that if money comes in from Stripe, that that was a transfer from Stripe to bank. Um, and so then you don't have to touch that either. Um, uh, yeah, and but, I mean, it still takes a bit of intervention at the end of a month to, to you know, uh, put in the Stripe fees that it's deducted and to reconcile things. But you shouldn't have to touch it any more often than, than once a month. Okay, thanks. And and to, um, would I would I ask you, Louise, to to do to get my integration integrated, whatever it is I have to do, or do um, I do that myself? I th I I think the best thing to do is to email support. It's Lynn that would okay. do an integration, but um, one of us can talk to Lynn. Um, I know that it's easy to integrate with Xero. Um, I I don't know off the top of my head whether the integration with QuickBooks is standard or not standard. And so I don't want to answer for Lynn on, on that until she's mm. had a look. Um, so yeah, uh, but yeah, the first port of call is just send us an email basically, and then we can work yeah. out where we go from here. Cool. Okay, thanks. Okay. It does work on QuickBooks, though, because that's that's what Stratco uses, what I use on Stratco. Um, but uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll sort you out. Great, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Also, this might be a nice opportunity if anyone feels like share. So Al, if you're using QuickBooks, that's really cool. And, and Rachel, you said you're using spreadsheets. So if anyone else wants to share what, what they're currently using for their food hub, that might be a really interesting thing for the group. Um, I think, some, well, something that I've been thinking about, obviously I don't have a, a food hub that I'm, you know, I'm not involved in the, I'm involved in producing food, but not actually then the selling side of it. And, you know, thinking further down the line and some other webinars I've been attending and something that's always been on my mind is like, I suppose it's more the profitability side of it in the sense of like, how, how is it? To, to be able to like pay farmers like a really decent living wage, but then at the same time make good food affordable for all and, you know, trying to find that balance and that that's the, the side that I 
I'm finding that I want to learn much more about because I know, you know, from doing the, the actual physical growing of food, how hard it is. And, and I know that some organizations I work for have been very good at like, you know, you, you time every part of your day and so they can accurately um, figure out, well, it, you know, it costs, for example, you know, 10 pounds to produce that many crates of, of beans or whatever. Um, but I just feel that it's it's finding that balance for profitability where the, the farmer gets paid the right uh, a fair wage, but it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to have that food. And I just think that that's the balance that's really difficult to get. Um, so it's, yeah, it was something that I was wanting to try and just hear if other people, how they do that and how they manage to accurately record how long it takes to produce food and then show if there is a, if there is a profit on it, if people are just breaking even or if people are actually, yeah, losing money, basically. I've never found an answer to that, I must admit. Um... You know, not, not speaking as a, as, a, as a bookkeeper, but as someone who, who ran a, a food hub. Um, I don't think there are any shortcuts. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear from some of you, but in one way or another, you rely on volunteers or something like that. I think um, the, the one piece of advice from being on the open support team is that um, if you are setting up a food hub, and I know this doesn't come down to the producer cost of food, but um, in terms of the cost of a, a hub, um, a lot of hubs will start off and think, oh, we've got no overheads, we want to pass on, um, you know, the cost price of our, of our produce to the customer. And, uh, and they run entirely on volunteers. But then after six months, you, you know, you, you people get tired and um, if they're having a full time job and then they're, and then they're working for the hub and it takes hours to do the accounts and the social media and everything, they want some kind of reward or they want to be have less time at work. So I, um, I think we've seen that um, setting an enterprise fee of something like 20% at least is really realistic. Um, I know 20% might sound quite high um, as a and um, if you're just starting off and by enterprise fee, I mean, that's kind of an overhead cost that you put on to the top of the cost of the food um, or the basic price as the supplier is coming to. Um, cost, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm certainly with you in terms of what the farmer should be charging. Um, they need to break even and not um, be producing their food at less than minimum the minimum wage as well as um at covering their costs um but I, I suppose this is this might come down to partly some of the work that Kay has been supporting food hubs in um sort of marketing your produce so really um if you can show the story behind it to your customers and how um how hard you're working to produce this food and also that it's local you know it's got no carbon miles to it and all the other benefits you might well find that people are prepared to pay that bit extra for it and I know it might be actually significant significantly extra but um, it's all about the message you give I think um, that's the that probably doesn't answer your question Francesca at all but um, I hope it uh, it'd be interesting to see here what other people think um, as well. But that's just some thoughts that I know we have. No, th thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really difficult question to answer um, because um, it's something that's so ingrained in in the production of food and, and how to make it affordable for the masses. But um, yeah, I do think your advice has been helpful. Just like you say, like if it's not just food that appears from nowhere, is it? If you actually help people um, understand what goes into, into growing and then harvesting and distribution, there's more of an understanding of why good food costs a bit more. So thanks, Louise. 
Uh, yeah, Francesca, one of the things I think Kay's going to probably, I'm going to jump in and answer for Kay here, but um, yeah, if you are on the Facebook group and you probably are, if you managed to come to this webinar, it, like there's a wealth of resources on how to show, display that, that story in a really positive way. And I'll let Kay continue. Sorry for jumping in. That's okay. I was about to say the same thing. I'll share the Facebook um, group link in the group chat in a second. And also what might be interesting for you, just not necessarily this topic, but kind of connected is we did a food equality webinar um, about a month ago, which is really interesting talking about how uh, food hubs are making um, local food more accessible. So that, that might be interesting for you on, the, on this topic. Um, so I'll share that as well. Um, yeah, so thanks for bringing up such an interesting um, question for us to, to think about. Um, so I'm looking at the time and it's called two. We've got a really healthy amount of time for questions today. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things. So meanwhile, have a think if there are any more questions that you want to ask before we sign off for the day. Um, but I just wanted to say that uh, we're thinking of sending a weekly update um, with stats from your food enterprise. So things like um, different metrics that you could use to track the, the growth of your enterprise. So what I mean by metrics is, for example, um, your weekly turnover, number of orders, average basket value, um, new customers that you might have gained. So I'm gonna bat my own question out to the, to the group here today and just ask what kind of metrics would be interesting for you to kind of measure your, your hubs, um, uh, yeah, um, growth or success on, yeah. Um, so does anyone have any, metrics that they feel would be useful in a weekly email. At the end of our trial, I was pulling off um, all of the orders and then did a pivot table to find out how many times different uh, customers had um, had ordered across the, the different sessions. And I found that really quite interesting because obviously, the, well, not obviously, but the majority of our customers were, were one off, um, but it was a short trial. Um, but there was a significant um, chunk for um, ordering four times, three times, two times, or once. And that, that was a good insight for me because it helped me to, to realize that those that had ordered once, you know, we need to work on those <laughs> uh, to try and get them back again. But hopefully it was just a too short a time and we would see them return if we were able to be trading just now. But uh, we look forward to that. So that, that would be helpful to me. That's really interesting. Thanks, Rachel. I've made a note. Um, any other things like this that, that might be interesting or useful? Anything that you've tried to find out yourselves that would be useful in a kind of automated weekly update? I think I would like to know um, when customers place their order, because then through knowing when our customers place our order, we can kind of know when to target social media. Um, what day, if, you know, if our, if our order cycles open for the whole week should we be hitting it on you know just the day before the order order cycle closes or maybe the weekend and things like that and it's fine for me to see that because we're quite we have quite small orders but I think for bigger enterprises it would be quite handy so they could really push that social media and really push those like newsletters and other things like that and that would be good. I think for me, all the things that already been mentioned, actually, just in terms of a number of orders, average spend per order, um, number of new or percentage growth of new new customers or new subscribers to eat to to news to newsletters and things like that. All, all those, I suppose those are, those are all the things that I'm measuring my enterprise against. But it just would be really interesting to see what other people's are doing because. I'm this month I've I'm I seem to be I've almost doubled this this weekend I have twice as many orders as I was having back in November but the spend has gone right down so it just be, would be really interesting to see if if other people are experiencing the same thing or or, or um, just to get a feel for what's happening out there lots of new customers coming in January so <laughs> why was why was that Things like that. So, if yeah, that would be really helpful just to see what other people are experiencing. All the things already mentioned. 
Thanks, so. Al. Does anyone have anything to share in response to Al's, Al's question? Um, just to clarify, Al, um, when you were asking, I think I might be completely wrong and Kay can tell me if I'm wrong. I think what we're proposing was that um, like you'd be sent out the stats for your particular hub, but are you saying it'd be really helpful to you for you to have like um, maybe a UK average sent as well as your particular hub stats? Or would you like to know, um, I don't know, data from the top five hubs of the country or uh, how, what kind of, um, as well as your own information, I, I'm not, I don't know whether it'd be possible to send out everybody else's information, um, but what would be helpful? Would, would it be like what was happening on average into other hubs in your area or, you know, just give me some idea. <laughs> okay, sorry, I, yeah, I was, I, so, yeah, I suppose in some ways I've I've got those I've got those figures but just because I track all those things for myself. So I could say if you're doing it, that would be great, but it's probably not. I suppose would be, what would be most useful would be benchmarking against other against other food hubs just to see what whether this is something that's happening across the country or whether it's just me. I just try and understand what's going on, really. But um, through the you know through the, through the year, I, mean, I guess that's you know that's in my old job, we used to do we we're, we're an part of a national organisation, and you'd see what um, you'd be sort of you you would benchmark yourselves against other similar sized uh, enterprises within that organisation. So if there was a way of you know if I could because actually if I you know if I wanted to if I was being if I saw Tamar, Tamar Food Hub um, figures, it may not mean that much because it's much different size enterprise, but if there was a similar size or a few other similar size ones, and if we could get agreement between all of us to share those, share those details, then that might just be quite interesting to see, to see any trends that are, that are similar across those properties. That might be too complicated, but it would be nice to see. No, I think that sounds like a really interesting idea because like, um, especially if the hubs are similar sizes and we do see that when we look at the data that um, I think uh, then you could pair up and compare notes about not just statistics, but other things as well. Hmm. And I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting as well. So you can kind of almost have like groups where you're kind of sharing information and learning from each other and seeing and then you can also yeah with pinpointing trends as well that would be really useful for marketing activities like for example if you've seen lots of new customers in January if that's a trend that other hubs are having then maybe that like yeah if that's that's a common trend then maybe next year it could be planning like a new customer drive in January or targeting your messaging around that so that's really interesting now thanks for that it's a really interesting idea Cool. Is that Sam? Do you have a question for the group or something to add? Yeah, I mean, just around the the data collection stuff. I mean, I'm coming at it from a producer level, um, but it would be quite interesting to me to know, you know, how how many tomatoes were sold in my local area for roughly how much. Is there any of that kind of level of reporting that's it's happening. I mean, it would be interesting nationally, but kind of particularly regionally, I guess. And that's a really interesting point. So if there was a way of looking at things on like a, you know, are there certain trending? Um, do we see any trends among produce and their popularity? And that's, a, that's a really interesting idea. Does anyone have any thoughts on that as well? Because I'm not sure if that's a functionality, but I can, but I'll, I'll ask, but I can see how that would be really interesting. Thanks, Sam. All right, thank you. Cool. So everyone, we've got five minutes to go. So I'm just gonna share um, something in the chat. It's a feedback form about this session. Um, it really helps us to improve these sessions for you if, if you could give us some feedback on how you found it. Um, 
there's anything that you would have improved or anything that would have made it more useful or anything that you did or didn't like um if you could let us know that's it really helps us to to improve these and does anyone have any final questions or comments Cool. So good timing, everyone. Five to five, five to five. So hang on time. So I'll um, work on, I'll get the recording in the um, uploaded in the event page on Facebook um, within the next couple of days. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much, Oliver, for your, um, for, for, yeah, for sharing so much information and for answering all these questions. And thanks everyone for their questions. And yeah, I feel like this has been a, a a really useful session. I've learned a lot of things that I didn't know. <laughs> so being a marketer and not a bookkeeper. Um, so thank you for that. And good luck to everyone. Brilliant. Thanks everyone for joining. Take thank care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.